Yeah. Hello, my name is Anna Siegel, uh, and I and I am the main state lead for U.S. Youth Climate Strikes. Thank you for being here. I am so grateful to all the other organizers here who have agreed to collaborate on this action and have made it stronger. Main Strikes could not have done this alone. Main Strikes is a youth-led organization and our state's chapter of U.S. Youth Climate Strikes. We have worked we have worked on past strikes in events such as the September 20th Global Climate Strike. Who went to that? Awesome! And are now working on a climate emergency campaign. A climate emergency is not just a legal document. It's a movement. 42 U.S. cities have declared an emergency alongside over a thousand more local governments and countries worldwide. Those places have all pledged to enact legislation in accordance with an emergency declaration, whether that's a 2030 timeline, banning new fossil fuel infrastructure, or ensuring a just transition. On Tuesday, October 8th, South Portland became the 1,101st city to declare a climate emergency. Since then, local climate emergency resolutions have been passed in Portland and Bar Harbor and Brunswick and presented to the towns of York and Newcastle with plans for more. Those actions were milestones in the effort of the youth to have Maine as a state declare climate emergency. No state has done that yet, and we hope to be the first. We demand that the Mills administration declare climate emergency for the state of Maine. That is why we are here today. We want that for the youth, for our children, for the air we breathe, for the water we drink, for the planet we thrive upon. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Lillian Hubbard. She's 18 and from Cape Nettick, Maine. She is the strikes director for Maine Strikes and is a freshman in college studying political science. Hi again, my name is Lillian. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone who came out to support the Maine climate change movement and taking the future of the earth into your own hands. My name is, uh, well, and I already said my name is Lillian. I'm with the Maine Youth Climate Strikes team. And I'm honored to have been given the opportunity to speak today and protest for something we all truly believe in. Times are dark right now, but this is all the more reason to be united within this crisis and help create a better future for the generations to come. We are in the beginning of a revolution and change will happen if we make ourselves heard. <clears throat> Climate change is the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced. According to the report the IPCC released last year, the Earth must stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius without the effects of climate change becoming permanent. Right now, we are on track to reach that temperature by 2030. If nothing is done to reverse the effects of this crisis before the end of the next decade, our home will become completely unsalvageable. Politicians are leaving the climate emergency in the youth's hands. We shouldn't be responsible for cleaning up the mess the older generations have caused. We shouldn't, ha we shouldn't have to protest for a chance to live our lives without the constant threat of climate change. In recent years, oceans have warmed, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, and the sea level has risen. So I'm just gonna hold off for a minute for that to set up. Oh, shit.
we go. <laughs> so in the future, we will be experiencing more droughts, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, and earthquakes. We are literally in the beginning of any disaster movie ever written, and that doesn't seem to mean anything to our uh, corporations and our politicians. If the temperature of the Earth continues to rise at the rate it is currently, the Earth will become completely unsalvageable by 2030. At this point, I will have not even celebrated my 30th birthday yet. Us teenagers shouldn't have to be thinking about our Earth dying on a daily basis. We should be hanging out with our friends, not attending protests for things we shouldn't even have to protest about. We should be in school worrying about our next math test, not about the dangers of the Earth's future. This is the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced, and we need to treat it as such. As one of my biggest inspirations, Greta Thunberg, once said, we need to act as if our house is on fire, because it is. Thank you. Next up is Emma Sawyer. Emma Sawyer is a student at the University of Southern Maine, majoring in environmental planning and policy, with minors in economics and applied energies. She is part of Maine Youth for Climate Justice and Maine Strikes. Hello, hello. Um, thank you guys for coming out. It's really cold, um, so we appreciate it. Um, I would like to continue what Lillian just said about how urgent this climate emergency really is. We absolutely must act fast because we can never solve a crisis without treating it as one. I'm going to do a little science lesson for a minute. Um, one of the major, yeah. Um, one of the major reasons why climate change is such a crisis is because of positive feedback loops, which I know is something that a lot of you maybe have never heard of before. Um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with the concept, a positive feedback loop is when any action reinforces itself, making it continue. Think about a snowball rolling down a snowy hill. One small push makes a snowball bigger, which makes it heavier and roll faster. You get the concept? Right, okay, good. So these positive feedback loops occur in the natural world, and a lot of them um, have gone, gotten kick-started and are now perpetuating climate change. Um, so I'm gonna give you two examples. The more that we let the ice caps melt, the less sunlight and heat they reflect away from the Earth. This lets the heat stay near the Earth's surface, melting the ice caps even more. So less ice allows more heat to stay, which means that more ice melts, and so on and so forth. So that's one. I'm going to keep going. Um, another one is water vapor is actually a greenhouse gas. It does the same thing as carbon dioxide. So the more that we let our atmosphere warm up, the more water can evaporate into the atmosphere. This then furthers the greenhouse gas effect and keeps the planet even warmer. So then more water evaporates, and then the planet gets even warmer, so on and so forth. You get the picture? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for responding to me, by the way. Um, so there are tons of these cycles that make the climate crisis increasingly difficult to solve, and every minute we wait, it gets harder. Right now, we're lobsters in a pot of heating water, and we can climb out, but with every minute that we sit idle and inactive, the harder and more effort it's gonna take to make a change. Everybody here has the ability to make some change. Even if you have no money, are too young to vote, you still have a voice, you still can act, you can still show up like you all have. We're all really privileged to be here and to have the information and education that we do and to have a government with so many levels that some of which do listen to us. So please do your part. Please help pull us out of this heating pot of water. Do it for yourself and do it for those who don't know or aren't able to act the way that we are. So thank you. You're all very wonderful. Register to vote at this table if you can.
Cecily Nisa is a seventh, is 13 and a seventh grader here at Wayne Fleet in Portland. For the past year, she's been coming to strikes and rallies and city hall meetings after learning how urgent the climate crisis is. Hi. Hi. Thank you all for coming out here today. My name is Cecily and I'm a seventh grader here in Portland. My family is and always has been very outdoorsy. Uh, we have been hiking and playing outside for as long as I can remember and I've always loved the natural world. Both my parents are teachers. My mother is an elementary school teacher and my father is a middle school science teacher. They both feel strongly about educating their students and me and my brother about the environment. All this has um, all this has led me to being here today. Although I have been aware of climate change for some time, and while I knew it was an issue, I didn't realize fully how important it was. The climate crisis seemed to grow more and more apparent as I got older, so in sixth grade I decided to take action. This year in science class we were studying climate change, and a lot of my classmates agree that this is a serious matter in class. However, outside of class, I have sometimes heard jokes about it. Maybe they're scared or feeling overwhelmed, but this is not a funny matter. This is, this is a crisis and it's frustrating to hear the jokes. Although the thought of climate change is a terrifying thing, we can make a difference. Like I said before, I started to make small life changes in sixth grade and learned about these climate rallies. I realize that even one individual can make a difference in a crowd of hundreds. We need to make our demands clear to our legislators. If you can vote, every single vote makes a huge difference so we can get people in office that understand that climate change needs immediate attention. But on a smaller scale, it is really easy to reduce or eliminate one's carbon footprint. Start at your house. You can demand green electricity from the electric companies. There is no reason that in 2019 we have to use electricity that's dependent on fossil fuels. My family has made simple and affordable changes to our house to make it more efficient and we have reduced our carbon footprint by 97%. Every one of us here today has made changes in our lives to help reduce our carbon footprint. It is also our responsibility to encourage others to do something. They can be as simple as the following. Replace old light bulbs with LED lights. Reduce your meat consumption. Remember to turn off lights when you aren't in a room. Unplug electronics when they are fully charged. Use reusable utensils, cups, and straws when possible. Reduce your use of single-use plastics, and research other ways you can do your part. Although all of these things sound basic, when we all do them, it can make a huge impact. But one of the most powerful things you, we can do is keep fighting for major climate action by showing up to things like this and continuing to spread awareness and educate others. Thank you. Now, uh, Anthony Marvin and Sophia Webster are going to lead us in some songs. Anthony Marvin is a hub coordinator of Sunrise Portland, a lifelong resident of Maine, and is fighting for a just, equitable future. <coughs> Sophia from Sunrise Movement, since Sophia has been involved with Sunrise, she says it has given her so much hope for the future. Tomorrow, can y'all hear me in the back? Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Tomorrow, I turn 25. For the adult allies, I ask you to think back to when you were my age. What kinds of things were you thinking about most? Perhaps your career, planning a family? 
I know I speak for a lot of people in my generation when I say, I would love to have kids one day. But frankly, it doesn't feel right bringing another human being into a world where I can't guarantee us a safe future. Science shows that we have 10 years to take dramatic action before the damage we've done to the climate becomes irreversible. What could that mean for humanity? For you, for me, for our families? For my friend who wants to move to Miami to pursue a music career, but is too afraid of natural disasters. For my friend who needs an insulin pump, and in the case of an extended power outage, would be without the pump that she needs to stay alive. Back when I was 13, it was a beautiful sunny day. My mom and I went out for some ice cream. Stepping out onto the porch, this swift wind came through. I turn around to grab my jacket from inside. We both love watching a good storm. I open up the door and this wind just rips the door out of my hand slams it closed. I go to open the door and it's just neither my mom or I could get that thing open. It was stuck shut. Go around, try the back door to no avail. What was now a full blown thunderstorm had locked us out of our own house. Trees were practically sideways. This storm was not entertaining anymore. One in particular across the street was looking particularly sideways. It missed our house, but laid straight across the street. I chewed my nails to a bit as my mom stepped across live power lines to get to our neighbor's house to make a call. Did you know that live power lines carry an electrical charge strong enough to cause serious injury or even death? This is just one example of one storm that got just a little too close. My parents still live in that neighborhood full of tall trees, all with the potential to wipe out people's homes, cars, and family members. I would never want to get the news that my family was made homeless because of a fallen tree. I realize extreme weather like this will become more common in the reality of climate change. We're lucky up here to not have to take on the full brunt of flooding or hurricanes, but that doesn't mean we're immune to the effects of a changing climate that is calling for our help, trying to shake us awake. The storms don't discriminate. We are fighting for human survival, for the possibility of a future. It's no longer just about protecting the environment. The earth will be just fine without us. Our planet has shown its magnificent ability to heal. It's up to us to decide if we want to be part of that healing or continue down a path of destruction. I invite you to join me in envisioning a world of climate justice. In those 10 years, yes, climate justice. In those 10 years that scientists say we have, I'll be 35. My life could look a lot different than I imagined it but it doesn't have to be that way. I yearn for a world I can feel excited to bring new life into. A world where I don't have to fear the future, where clean water flows from every faucet, where we as consumers can feel good about the choices available to us, where every grocery store and corner market will brim with fresh and local produce grown by workers who are paid a living wage. <laughs> High speed wind powered rail so that it can bring travelers to see the world while minimizing our footprint upon it that stops in every rural town so that young people can go to the jobs created in this process and feel like there's a future for us here. <laughs> I dream of a world where we can celebrate the earth rather than mourn her slow death. Where there are green spaces down every alley, rooftops, gardens on every rooftop. Purifying our air, turning it into clean, breathable oxygen. 
I believe in a world where we can trust our leaders are making decisions that prioritize the health and well-being of all of us. By declaring a statewide climate emergency, Maine can be a leader in this country and be urged to act upon our current goals. I know this world isn't beyond our reach. We just have to decide we are worth it. Thank you. being here when it's so cold and standing for so long. Great, so like um, Anna said, I work for 350 Maine, which is an intergenerational grassroots organization that fights for climate justice um, and advocates for a just transition in Maine. The great thing about 350 Maine and being part of this movement with all of these organizations who are here today is that I know I'm in a fight with folks who care deeply about the justice aspect of this movement. I know these organizations understand that the climate crisis has been created by systems of oppression towards marginalized communities, colonization, exploitation of nature, and white heteropatriarchies. We are all working for a future where climate crisis is no longer an issue, and we want to do so in a way that is just and doesn't leave anyone else behind. So although the climate crisis makes things look bleak and easily fills us with dread, anxiety, hopelessness, you know, all that, um, 
Yeah, at times I still have hope that things can get better because I know that this movement is being led by youth and committed organizations like the ones here today. I also know that there are many adults out there who are fighting with youth and absorbing our senses of urgency into their lives and work. But with this hope, I also know we have to do this right and that we can't let up until more communities in Maine are treating climate change like the crisis it is and that the state of Maine has declared a climate emergency and implemented policies that reflect this declaration. Yeah. <laughs> To do this right, we also have to push for change that is fair for everyone. We need urgency, but we also need a just transition and true systems changes. Leaders and policymakers can't put pressure for turning the climate crisis around solely on individuals and individual actions. When, yeah. when the fossil fuel industry and other corporations have created systems that put profit before people for years. For example, in Maine, you can't tell folks to drive less and expect them to still function in rural spaces without providing adequate systems of public transportation. We can't have 2045 and 2050 deadlines for going carbon neutral or phasing out fossil fuels in privileged places like the U.S. The state of Maine should adapt bolder timelines like the cities of Portland and South Portland recently did after youth demanded that they do so in September, aiming to be carbon neutral in 2030 because 2030 ti timelines are the ones that give youth and frontline communities the best shot at livable futures. <laughs> And when Maine begins to switch to more and more renewable energy for timelines that meet the urgency this crisis requires, Maine and other states in New England shouldn't be relying on energy that leads to further oppression of marginalized groups and major environmental damage, just so another corporation continue, can continue profiting off of exploitation, but now under the false pretense of being green. For example, in Maine, we can't tout hydropower from Canada as the solution for New England. When the dams this energy is coming from are destroying indigenous communities, traditional lifestyles, and the ecosystems indigenous folks rely on. This is not climate justice. We need local sources of energy so that renewable energy in New England isn't complicit with corporate greed and oppression. Yeah. Ultimately, we cannot rely on our normal to get out of this, and we absolutely cannot allow similar systems to continue if we want to live in a world that has a livable future for younger generations and folks on the front lines of the climate crisis. So while we fight for urgent change, we must also be aware of how we're asking for change to occur. And this is not to say that we're, the work we're doing isn't admirable. Every time youth and adults come out to these strikes, lions, days of actions, we are making impacts and changing how communities are thinking about this crisis. Just look at how much has happened since September 20th alone. This means towns and cities all over Maine either have committed or will likely take bold action in the next 10 years trying to phase out fossil fuels by 2030. This is why later in the strike we're going to be lying down for 10 minutes to represent how many years we have left to take action. We have power and we are making a difference and each action brings new momentum and energy. So keep showing up, getting involved, sign up at the, with the organizations um, over there, just plugging that. Uh, make your voices heard and demand that urgency and action we need in Maine happens now. Luke Sakara Flanders is a co-founder of Community Water Justice and currently a junior at Freiburg Academy. He is, he is, also, he is also a member of Sunrise Maine and has been involved in water justice issues for seven years. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Luke and I'm coming from Freiburg, Maine. Shout out to the Freiburg Youth Delegation. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> um, I am here representing Community Water Justice, a network of frontline communities working for better stewardship of our groundwater through education, policy, and action. As many of you already know, one of the biggest threats we are facing here in Maine is the private ownership and exploitation of our public water sources. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Poland Springs bottled water, which I'm sure many of you recognize, is owned by Nestle, the largest food and beverage corporation in the world. 
It is the number one selling scanned item in all of metropolitan New York City and is now being marketed to people on the West Coast. Whoa. Nestle is taking the other taking the water from our aquifers out of our ecosystem to not only expand their profits, but create a dependency on their brand with little benefit to our communities. The manufacturing of billions of plastic bottles that don't get recycled while inflating the price by a thousand times to sell back to us and others across the country is a scam that we can't afford to support. Last month, I joined a small delegation to an international conference on water in Ontario, Canada, where we met people from other frontline communities fighting Nestle. What is becoming more clear to me oh. <laughs> What is becoming more clear to me is that Nestle works hard at undermining communities across the globe and privatizes our common wealth in water. This is legalized theft, because water is life, all life. And should, be not, and should not be sold for profit. <laughs> Nestle is using the same tactics of misleading the public, manipulating their way into government, and making empty promises to communities they see as prospects. The, there are places now in the global south which continue to be exploited to the point that areas that once had a natural abundance of water are now facing significant scarcity. Did you know that in Vittel, France, farmers are now having to truck in their water from remote areas to feed their livestock and orchards, which haven't bloomed for years due to Nestle's decades-long water extraction from that region? <laughs> On top of all this, the bottled water industry is deeply connected to the fossil fuel industry. In the US, bottled water companies used over 76 million barrels of oil for production and distribution in a single year. It is, on a global scale, it is estimated that 22 billion plastic water bottles entered the waste stream, ending up in our oceans, waterways, and landfills. Nestle... <laughs> Nestle is not the only corporation benefiting from the hyper-exploitation of Maine's natural resources. For example, more than half the state is now engaged in heavy debate over the proposed CMP energy corridor that threatens Maine's western forests and only provides Massachusetts with dirty megadam energy at the grave expense of the indigenous peoples of Quebec, Canada. Up in up in Belfast, a multinational corporation has proposed a land-based fish farm which would consume millions of gallons of groundwater daily, put hundreds of tons of waste into Penobscot Bay annually, and, more, and nearly double the carbon footprint of the entire city of Belfast. On top of that, this will be the largest land-based fish farm in the world. We need to be decentralizing our food systems to be sustainable, not setting up mega farms which will not only harm local fisheries but overconsume and pollute the water. Is this what giving up on our future generations looks like? And why is the state still engaged in a corporate backed lawsuit to take away the stewardship of the Penobscot River from the Penobscot people? The Penobscot have done a better job of treating the water with respect than the state or corporations have. So there is no just reason to claim ownership of something that should be stewarded, just as the Penobscots have done for thousands of years before they were disrupted by the horrors of colonization. Previous attorney generals have concluded that the Penobscot River is a part of the Penobscot Reservation, and our generation demands the state to ensure that decision is upheld. 2020 is the 200th so-called birthday of the state of Maine. We can celebrate by respecting the Wabanaki as sovereign nations and finally honor our agreements. In reality, these issues are all simply different heads of the same monster. All of these industries are benefiting from the disrespect of our most valuable water sources using the same weaknesses in our government and legal infrastructure. 
How we treat water is how we show respect for life. What does it say about our culture? Will you join me in fighting disrespectful and exploitative entities whose prospects destroy our environment? Yeah! Yes, let's go. Yes, okay, that's good. <laughs> Uprooting the destructive power which corporations such as Nestle have come to wield in Maine may seem like an insurmountable task. It may be easier for individuals or organizations to ignore this truth and address problems that have simple solutions. But in doing so, they turn their backs on people living in frontline communities, struggling with the exploitation, destruction, and corruption which threaten to ruin our chance at a stable, healthy future. The best things in life are worth fighting for. And when life itself is at threat, we have no choice. Maine. Maine is right on the front line of this crisis. We can't, we can't look to national directives or hope that the right presidential candidate will get elected. We cannot delegate all of this important work to the people at the State House or in Washington. We need you. If you are able, we need you to organize, fight on behalf of our commons, fight for marginalized people, support candidates who are willing to throw down in the name of climate justice. Boycott, boycott destructive, boycott destructive corporations. And empower young people to have a hand in the future we shape today. We need action on behalf of young people and future generations. Join the water and climate justice movements today and let get, let's get the most important jobs done. Thank you. All right, hang in there, we know it's cold. But last speaker, Jess Falero, is an activist and writer who works with Extinction Rebellion, the People's Housing Coalition, and the 180 Collaborative. They testify regularly at City Council and the State House in the pursuit of social justice. And I'd also like to ask that people stay off the stairs um, on this side. Thank you. We hold the following to be true. This is our darkest hour. Humanity finds itself embroiled in an event unprecedented in its history, one which unless immediately addressed, will catapult us further into the destruction of all we hold dear. This nation, its peoples, our ecosystems, and the future of generations to come. The science is clear. We are in the sixth mass extinction event, and we will face catastrophe if we do not act swiftly and robustly. Biodiversity is being annihilated around the world. Our seas are being poisoned, acidic, and rising. Flooding and desertification will render vast tracts of land uninhabitable and lead to mass migration. Our air is so toxic that the United States is breaking the law. It harms the unborn while causing tens of thousands to die. The breakdown of our climate has begun. There will be more wildfires, unpredictable superstorms, increasing famine, and untold drought as food supplies and fresh water disappear. The ecological crisis that are impacted upon the nation and on this planet and its wildlife can no longer be ignored, denied or go unanswered by any beings of sound, rational mind, ethical conscience, moral concern, or spiritual belief. In accordance with these values, the virtues of truth and the weight of scientific evidence, we declare it our duty to act on behalf of the security and well-being of our children, our communities, and the future of the planet itself. We, in alignment with our consciousness, and our reasoning, declare ourselves in rebellion against our government and the corrupt, inept institutions that threaten our future. The willful complicity displayed by our government has shattered meaningful democracy and cast aside the common interest in favor of short-term gain and private profit. When government and the law fail to provide any assurance of adequate protection and security for its people's well-being and the nation's future, 
It becomes the right of citizens to seek redress in order to restore dutiful democracy and to secure the solutions needed to avert catastrophe and protect the future. It becomes not only our right, but our sacred duty to rebel. We hereby declare the bonds of the social contract to be null and void. The government has rendered them invalid by its continuing failure to act appropriately. We call upon every principled and peaceful citizen to rise with us. We refuse to bequeath a dying planet to future generations by failing to act now. We act in peace with ferocious love of these lands in our hearts. We act on behalf of life.